Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. Raised on rock and blues music, Laser Lloyd grew up in Connecticut. At age 15, Laser was already playing in the nightclubs along the Connecticut shoreline and in New Haven with his group, Legacy. Many call him Israel's king of the blues, and this blues, rock, folk guitarist, and singer-songwriter aims to spread his love of the blues across Israel. Everybody's got his own story. Everybody's got his own fight. Everybody's got his own reason for living. Everybody's got his own way to die. I grew up as a rock and roller, you know, and uh, grew up in uh, Connecticut, New Jersey. My father was a musician, had a guitar around, and we moved many times. So my best friend was the guitar. At about 14, my father took me to my first Santana concert. And that was it. That was the first time I saw someone pray. Santana comes out to the edge of the stage, and it's like, shh, he's praying there. He's just praying. And uh, I knew there's nothing else I could do. And to make a long story short, I was uh, at age 16 already playing in the bars. Then I went to college, the major music. When I came back, I had a demo, and I had a showcase with Atlantic Records. It was a real long shot, and it was an unbelievable break, and I moved into Manhattan. And at the same time, I was recording for Atlantic Records. I met this homeless person in Central Park. It's a whole story. It's a whole Megillah, as they say. And uh, he told me, I started speaking to him. He says he's Jewish. He says he prays every day where they need a minion, where he sleeps on the street. Anyway, I went to check it out. Two weeks later, I found myself playing a concert with Rav Shlomo Kalibach in the middle of Manhattan. This is 1994. And so he really just liked the way I played the blues to his music, and I just really liked his persona. It was like, wow, first time I really felt I met a real hippie. So he really felt authentic, like real love, but there also had something spiritual going on there. It wasn't just looking for a good time or, you know. And I was blown away by his stories and the whole teaching. So he said, come on, you got to play with me in Israel. I said, what are you, nuts? I mean, I'm recording here, Atlantic Records. I got, you know, the whole thing happening. He says, no, brother, you gotta, he, this is what he did for a lot of people. He, he just, he, he didn't tell them to go to Torah and make tshuva. He just knew if he, get them, he could get them to the land of Israel, the holiness of the land would do it. So he got me to come to Israel, and uh, I've been here ever since. And, uh, but I kept going with my blues and rock and roll because this is what I really love to do and know how to do, and this is the music that really moves me. I've just added the spiritual content into the puzzle. Rock and roll is the biggest gift to the world that God has, for centuries that he's given. I mean, how many things can you get people to go to that amount of people? A rock concert. So the power of the music is so powerful, it inspires people. So there's nothing, no conflict with godliness there. But if you take the same power of the music and put the right message there, I mean, that's what you really can have. So, you know, there's no conflict. It's just that everything great in the world, just like nuclear power, it can really clean up the world. We don't have to use gasoline, all these things. At the same time, it can really it can blow up the whole world. So as a Jew, our job is to take the most powerful things, the most resourceful things, like the internet. This is really the gula. So a, a Jew is not to be afraid of the world. A Jew is to tackle and to be the leader. We used to be the leaders of the new technology of everything in the world. But the diaspora really changed and put, uh, put the Haredi world and the Jewish world behind, it used to be that the world did it. In Europe, they forced the Jews to be in the ghetto, they forced Jews, but now the Jew has to get out of the ghetto. We have to get out of that mindset and not be afraid of the world, and a lot of the Jewish world is still in that mindset. But the real leaders who know what's going on, they use all the technology and all the powerful things, and the Jews, we have to lead the world and show them, oh, rock and roll, you're right, it's awesome. So we need to take all that energy and just use it for the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And the electric guitar is just like, whew, it's, 
It's incredible, you know? In recent years, Laser Lloyd has shifted his focus to a new project, the Laser Lloyd Blues Band. He has been able to successfully cross over into the Israeli mainstream music scene and has been featured on a number of Israeli television channels, including Channel 8's TV's Guitar Heroes, Channel 10's London and Kirschenbaum, as well as on Yoav Kutner's Army Radio program. People can we get together? They don't come from a religious background. And um, I got introduced from Rav Kalibach to the Torah world. And when I came to Israel, it was quite amazing that I really just fell in love with the people. But, you know, on the plane, I met, you know, the first time uh, Haredi people, it was the first time, and I was very impressed. People that are studying Torah all the time. And I started learning some Torah because of Rav Shlomo. I started going to yeshiva, but at the same time, you know, I was playing guitar and going to the kibbutzim and all the clubs, but all of a sudden I saw there was a major problem. I was very surprised, I was shocked, because I had just come from America and living in Manhattan, where you go on the subway train and in with three blocks you see maybe 120 different religions, ethnic groups, and everyone's sitting on the train and all my friends are diverse and I just learned to get along. And here I come to Israel and I, I realize, wow, the, the Israeli people and the Jewish people in Israel are so dysfunctional. It's a really dysfunctional family. I said that really the, everyone is so great, but I was just so hurt me when I heard the way they talk, each one about the other. It's like really propaganda, like when I was in Russia, in, in the US, in the 70s with Russia, it's like, you know, you talk to someone on a kibbutz and what he thinks of someone who's Haredi, it's like super propaganda, he has no idea. And when you go, when you're sitting when you're married Sharim, and you hear them what they think about someone in Tel Aviv, it's like you think you're between 200 years ago in Budapest or something, like in the times when the Enlightenment started. So I was really shocked by this. And I just said, you know, I just not, can't sit on the sides. I have to go out and uh, try to put the Jewish people back together and, and, and help educate them that really, listen, Am Yisrael and all its branches are so beautiful, but we got to get over this thing and we got to really find out who we really are and not from the media, you know? The media does a real good job at making money and the way they make their money is, you know, one of the most motivating factors to get people to watch TV is hate and fear. So a lot of, there's a lot of propaganda and the same thing I think is promoted in the Torah world is hate and fear is promoted there and they keep people scared, they tell stories, but when they just go out, you know, people say, you know, you meet the Jewish people are so beautiful in all the shapes and sizes and we really can't survive if we're not going to be together because the Torah world, the Jewish people have never survived just by studying Torah. It's never written anywhere, and we've never just survived only having an army. And for sure, our, our job in the world is not only to bring high tech to the world. That's not what Hashem needed the Jewish people for, even though we should be directing high tech in a positive, positive manner. So I said with this song, you know, listen, I'm, I have to get all the different people who I am exposed to, and I get, get a chance to play for every day. I'm Shelly. not many artists like you have Israeli artists who their main people are to play for Israelis, secular Israelis, or people who play for Mizrahi, Misorti people, or people who play only in the Haredi world. And I, I'm uh, very blessed that I, I, I play for all these type of people. And I live with the Haredi people in the most, what you would say, ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods for many years. And at the same time, I was still playing at the clubs at night in Tel Aviv with the most 
secular atmosphere, and really it's just the same people, just different costumes. It's, and there's really a lot to be learned in a lot of places. There's a lot of things we have to learn from this Torah world that even though it's so different from for me, and I don't want to try to be like them, and we don't have to try to be like each other, but we have to learn what we, we need to learn from each other. I was just amazed living in the Haredi, um, like a Mary Sharim neighborhood in Ramat Pichemish Bet, there's just so much to be learned from those people. The, the Yiddish, um, they really captured something by protecting themselves, while at the same time, they for sure don't have all the pieces of the puzzle for the future of Am Yisrael. And at the same time, I'm just really amazed. It's, it's just beautiful the way that Israeli people have built the country in, you know, 65 years. How, it's just amazing to me what they've been able to do. And, and, and the high tech, and you see an average Israeli that by age 20 has been in the army and everything. There's so much, I'm really in awe of them. I'm really in awe of them. You know, I think of myself when I go back to America and see a 20 year old American, what he's done. And when you meet an, an Israeli that's finished the army and what, it's just amazing. But we have to put the pieces together. So this song, Am Shali, is just praising how great all the Jewish people are and all their sizes and just to get mutual respect. And I'm fighting hard on this on a daily basis, and I think there's a lot of progress being made, but we have a lot more to go. And it's, we're in danger if we don't get it done. I think there's some people that can really keep the kashrut, the, best they can, but at the same time, they do it in a peaceful way, you know? You should be able to do everything in respect to make someone feel comfortable. You don't have to, no one, I don't ask anyone to sacrifice their religious principles, but there's people that can do it in a way that you don't, uh, you know, insult the, the, uh, the other. And I think that has to be taught more in the Jewish community. One thing that Shlomo said that really, really knocked me out of the water, I heard him say one time, he says, Jewish people are so smart. They can know about everything in the world. They can know about, you know, you know, engineering, history, philosophy, everything. But when it comes to finding out what it really means to be a Jew and what's Judaism, all of a sudden they become stupid. He said, how come you guys can know everything? As soon as you want to find out, and he was the most accepting of all rabbis, but he said he got really upset because he saw in all the, the rich modern people in America, they just, what did, he said, what do they want to do? They don't want to do what Judaism is. So what, with their money and power, they want to try to change what Judaism is, is. And he says, come on, you can't do that. Just say you don't want to do it or do something else. But don't try to keep telling people who have been doing what their parents, the generation, that it's not Judaism. And he used to tell people the only way to really avoid having these really um, fanatic groups take over the Judaism, Jewish religion, is we ourselves have to become educated. We ourselves have to really do it the right way and know what to answer and know when, wh wh what is the real Judaism. And then this way, but he says, whenever there's ignorance, then the people, the fanatics, they can control it. But he says, so he says, every Jew has to just get on board and start realizing the, the way is not to become more secular or more against, it doesn't help. We just have to inform ourselves on what it means to really be a Jew and just do it and be a good example and don't don't try by force to change anyone else. It won't work. It doesn't make things the right nasty articles. It just doesn't work. Continuing with our series, Shtetl by the Sea, this week, Hedy Davis takes us on a guided tour of the beautiful Musenberg Synagogue. There was a good, strong community in Musenberg already in the early, I oh, can't say 20s, before the 20s. 1916, they got themselves the first Jewish teacher. He was a reverend, Reverend Wald. And two years later, they needed a minister, Reverend Mickelson. 
he came via London to, to Cape Town. And the, they had to save money to buy first a little piece of land. And it was very, very hard to raise 1,400 pounds in those days because the people were really poor. This is what most people don't realize. They came from very, very hard backgrounds. Some of them came with no possessions other than the family Torah, which they wouldn't part with. That's how those Torahs came to South Africa. People took their most cherished possession, which was a Torah, and then they would come with that to South Africa. They had no clothes, they didn't change. They just had one outfit that they wore on the boat coming over. For three months, they wore the same clothes. Here we are coming to the Musenberg Synagogue. Originally, the first foundation stone was laid in 1924, but it took a while to get the building finished. Although the foundation stone was laid in 1924, the original builder went machula. That means he went broke. And so the community had to start all over again fundraising. And in 1924, this was a very poor community. It really was. Uh, the Ladies Guild baked cakes and things like that just to try and raise the funds. So here we have it, the foundation stone laid by the Reverend A.P. Bender, whose name you will see on many synagogues built around the 1920s. And so one of the members of the community built the shul and didn't charge them one cent. His name was McCarthy. Not a very Jewish name, you heard, you heard there. He met his bride in London and the father said, she was the daughter of a rabbi, you want to marry my daughter, you have to be Magaiad. So he converted. He went to South Africa and within a few, few months, he'd worked so hard that he was able to bring his wife out to South Africa, his young bride out to South Africa. They lived in Cork Bay, they had three children. He was a member of the first congregation uh, committee and he was a faithful member of the community right until the day he died. His, he and his wife are buried in the cemetery in Musenberg. Coming into the shul, you enter the feeling of peace and calm. The beautiful mug and daubed in the marble on the floor, the mug and daubed above us at the entrance. The president's boards face us as we come in and we see the people who since 1919 have kept this synagogue alive and running. I'm entering the downstairs, which is the men's section. It's very much as it was a hundred years, nearly a hundred years ago. The eternal light was donated when the shul was first opened and still is lit to this day in memory of Mrs. Slessing, who had died. I doubt she ever came into the shul though. In its heyday, the synagogue would be packed to the rafters. Children would sit on the steps. There would be an overflow service in the Weary Road Hall down the road. And at the same time, there were a lot of kids who spent most of their lives playing on the field across the road. There's a little stream. I think there's not one person who didn't tell me at some time or other, they slipped and fell and wet their shoes because that was what they used to do. Not everybody went to synagogue. Here you notice the seats are small. People were small in those days. Uh, great big lumps of men today find it uncomfortable sitting in the chairs because they don't have the place for leg room. As a lady, I have the same difficulty upstairs. There's just simply no leg room. But that's how it was. The beautiful windows were designed, the little green panels of glass. Today, nobody would put in little green panels of glass, but it was maybe the fashion. Maybe someone thought it would be decorative. It adds a sense of warmth and light to the synagogue. turn of the century, before the establishment of the Musenberg Synagogue, there were no facilities available for Orthodox Jews in Musenberg. They had to order kosher meat from Weinberg and walk to retreat for a minion. Hedy Davis talks more about the shtetl by the sea. The 
the shul didn't keep rabbis very long. There was a Reverend Frank, though, who came in 1924 and worked for that community for 40 years. And he was kind of the backbone of the synagogue itself. This beautiful little synagogue um, never had a great choir. Choir masters came, choir masters went until they had Reverend Goldwasser, who was a refugee from Germany. And he was there for about 25 years. There was a time there was a real need to get a rabbi. And Chief Rabbi Abrams suggested Rabbi Weinberg. He was from Oxford in England. And so he came out in the early 50s with his wife and two daughters. He stayed until 1961-62. We have the ark over here that was originally quite a bit forward and was rebuilt during the late 50s, when it, or late 50s, I think, when it was decided that they would be able to put more seats for the women upstairs, and so they pushed it out towards the fence. A very interesting item is this stender, we call it a stender, a place to rest your book. And it was given to the synagogue many, many years ago in memory of the son of Reverend East. The son was drowned in 1909. And this stender is used to this day by people who stand here and pray. Here we are climbing the stairs up to the ladies' gallery. Ladies were so strong they could climb. One should imagine the synagogue full. Even when Rabbi Weinberg was around in the late 50s, early 60s, he had a sense of humor. And there was Tilly Stern, who was not the most regular shulgoer. One day, Rabbi Weinberg approached her. Mrs. Stern, when I sit and look upstairs, I see Mrs. Rabbi. When Mr. Barnett looks upstairs, he sees Mrs. Barnett. When Abe Shapiro sits in the box, he sees Mrs. Shapiro. And when Bertie looks up, Mrs. Stern interjected at that point and said, he sees Mrs. Rabbi, Mrs. Shapiro, and Mrs. Barnett. That is believed put an end to the rabbi's attempt to turn Mrs. Stern into a regular shulgoer. This week, our excerpt from chapter 2, verse 2 of Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, comes from Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who said, Those who work for the community should do so for the sake of heaven, for then merits of their ancestors shall aid them and the righteousness shall endure forever. And you, says God, I shall credit you with great reward as if you have achieved it. Sadly, that's the end of this week's episode of Simcha. Thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to catch up on any previous week's episodes, log on to our website, www.spiritsister.co.za. From myself, Eitan Berger, and the whole team here at Simcha, have a great week and goodbye.